Playmates Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles isn't everyone's cup of tea. The figures are outlandish, wildly varied, and give off a less mature vibe than a lot of other figure lines. On the flip side, the core characters are iconic, all of the figures and accessories are vividly colored, and as you can see, they have a serious impact on display. For me, these are the last word in Ninja Turtle action figures. My journey with Ninja Turtles is now complete because of these. I don't need to go looking for any others, and so I'm not going to be doing any more looking. Cowabunga! If there's one thing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles taught me as a kid in the 1980s, it's that you'll scrounge for another quarter for one more go with the heroes in a half shell. As happy as I was with my vintage turtles and my original comic style NECA turtles, a friend of mine told me the Super 7 Ultimates range of 7-inch turtles figures were worth a look. Trusting his recommendation, I started building up a collection to evaluate, and he surprised me with a pile of them to fill in the gaps I hadn't yet acquired. As the line is a tribute series to the original Playmates figures, I was only interested in characters from the initial year of the toys, and certain key characters that came later, specifically Casey Jones and Baxter Stockman. The figures I ended up with were the Four Turtles, Splinter, April O'Neil, Shredder, Bebop, Rocksteady, a Foot Soldier, and the aforementioned Casey Jones and Baxter Stockman. With all of these in 7-inch scale, they're not easy on display shelf real estate, and Super 7 has sent them in some of the most involved packaging I've ever seen, which makes me wonder how much of the $50 per figure price tag is paying for the box. I should say boxes. There's the window box, then the outer sleeve, then the plastic wrap, then another plain cardboard outer box. Inside, with the figures themselves, you'll get various alternate heads, hands, and accessories. And even here, there appears to be a lot of wasted plastic. In a strange nostalgia play, they've opted to provide redundant accessories for every figure. So, for example, you get Leonardo's swords, but you also get his swords and other gear attached to that weapons rack in brown, just like the vintage action figures. April O'Neil's figure is given two different microphones, one that I assume is supposed to be more animation accurate, and the Playmate's gray version attached to that accessory sprue. There's also a flashlight that you'll think is a microphone for five minutes before you realize, nope, it's a torch. If we're banking on the idea that these should be ultimate, as the title of the range suggests, then why is Super 7 straddling this line between refined versions of the original Playmates figures and literal recreations of the vintage accessories just in 7-inch scale in the same package? Are we supposed to see these as ultimate because they're the Playmates figures, just bigger? Or are they ultimate because their intent is to fully realize the potential of the Playmates concept? If it's the former, then there's no need for the refined but redundant accessories and the alternate heads. If it's the latter, then there's no need for the Playmates-style accessories and heads. Eliminating one or the other and scaling back on the overdone packaging would have kept the price of these toys far more reasonable. But beyond Super 7's conceptual schizophrenia with this line, how are the figures? I actually think, despite some issues, they're pretty cool for the most part. Let's start with the turtles themselves. We have Leonardo with his vintage head, as well as a head that looks more like the way they were drawn in the comics at the time. The sculpt seems to occupy a space between the Eastman and Laird art of the mid-1980s and the early Archie Comics run when the Playmates figure line launched. As stated previously, he comes with all of his weapons in both Ultimate form and on the brown weapons rack. He also has open and closed versions of the Turtles communicator, a few pairs of hands, and a slice of pizza. Donatello has the same rundown of parts and accessories as Leonardo, this time with two ultimate bow staffs as well as the weapons rack versions. Raphael has all of these accessory options as well, but also comes with three pairs of Psy a dull gray set packaged in his belt, a more deluxe silver set, and the Playmates weapons rack set. Unfortunately, the Psy are very prone to bending, so enjoy trying to iron those out with a heat gun. Michelangelo is where the accessory pattern takes another turn. We get three pairs of nunchucks, a pair with actual chains, a pair with painted plastic chains, and a pair with the Playmates weapons rack in basic brown, but with sculpted chains and not the original Playmates-style cord attachment. 
But Michelangelo is also the only turtle packed without a turtle communicator, and instead comes with his late series turtle grapple hook weapon. He also comes with a box of pizza that unfortunately doesn't close, and the slice inside is in the center of the box and isn't removable. This might sound like nitpicking, but when you consider the rest of the turtles come with a single slice, it would have made sense to have the opportunity to complete the pizza by completing the figure collection. I'm honestly not sure why they didn't do that. Give all the first wave heroes a slice of pizza, and Mikey comes with the box to put them all in. Oh well. As far as the turtles go as figures, they are hefty little guys with a lot more articulation than our old 1980s versions had. I did notice they arrive with some kind of lubricating oil blasted into a lot of their joints, and some hinges were dripping with it. I'm not sure if that's the cause, or merely a contributing factor, but these figures feel like they're going to loosen up very quickly over time, as they are not that tight right out of the box. Because of the weight of the turtle's central torsos, I have concerns these figures' limbs won't hold the weight of the bodies if the joints are used too much. One of the biggest criticisms against Super 7 over the years with their Ultimates line has been the lack of sophisticated articulation, and it is a valid observation. Given the price Super 7 is charging for these versus where modern action figure technology has gone, Super 7 figures in the posability department hardly feel ultimate most of the time. But I also recognize that for most adult collectors, including myself, all of the articulation and hands and heads are so the buyer has maximum opportunity to pick their favorite pose before placing the figure in a case or on a shelf where it will likely sit undisturbed for more than a few years. When it comes to Ninja Turtles, my posing challenge always comes down to the poster of the turtles I had in my room as a child. You know the one, it came from the Eastman and Laird comics, and also just happened to be used for the Nintendo game box cover. I love the comic turtles the most, and this image is how I see them first and foremost. The first step to putting the Ultimates Turtles to this test was choosing the heads. While the Playmate-style heads are spot-on to the 1980s figures, they don't match the expressiveness of the detail and articulation Super 7 has designed into the bodies of the Ultimate Turtles. They feel slightly too large, and, frankly, clash with the revised aesthetic somewhat. To each their own, but I much preferred the revised heads in every respect. Yes, including the open-mouthed Michelangelo that is freaking a lot of collectors out. Very likely it doesn't bother me because that classic poster had him making an open-mouthed expression also, just less happy. With the weapons and heads decided, the final result was better than I anticipated. I was shocked the Super 7 articulation allowed Raphael to achieve an almost identical pose to the poster. Leonardo was able to take his place without issue. And while I never expected Michelangelo to be able to wrap the nunchuck around his shoulder, he was able to take on a pose that was dynamic enough to fit the bill. Donatello was the only frustration here, as Super 7's chosen joints might allow Raphael to get low and deadly, but do not allow Donnie a seemingly simple over-the-shoulder pose with the bow staff. You should also note his bow staffs are far too short overall, which doesn't help matters. All that said, this is the closest I've ever seen Turtles figures achieve the poster image. I also really like the way the faces turned out, though I could have done with some more expressiveness on Donatello's mouth. Next up is Splinter. Oddly, Super 7 has chosen to cut down on doubling up on the accessories here. While a lot of the smaller weapons rack accessories like the sword, cane, and arrows are duplicated, Splinter's bow now has a real bowstring and no permanently knocked arrow, and there is no Playmate-style version included. Splinter is also provided with a baby turtle and a steaming mug of tea, as well as his cartoon-accurate walking stick if you prefer it over the sword cane. What Splinter does come with is both a cloth robe like the original figure, as well as a PVC version of the robe. The letdown here is while I much prefer the cloth version, the belt created to hold the cloth version in place is an elastic band threaded through a metal buckle, while the correct looking belt has been molded into the PVC robe instead. Because, of course they did. As nice as Splinter is, his ability to stand up is pretty terrible. Don't get me wrong, he stands up just fine, but his feet are so janky there's no way to get them both flat on the ground. Despite being an essential character for a Ninja Turtles collection, Splinter is a poster child for the Ultimate series shortcomings. This is a figure that was already problematic from its original design, and the Ultimate's treatment did little to nothing to improve the situation. In fact, in terms of the feet, Super 7 only managed to make the situation worse. He's not even that great at standing around because his walking stick isn't long 
long enough to touch the ground. Splinter isn't alone in the standing around department. Super 7 made sure to give us April O'Neil as well. Now, full disclosure, April O'Neil was one of three Ninja Turtle figures I owned as a kid, alongside Michelangelo and Yusagi Yojimbo. So she has a special place in my memories. I found her at Target on an end cap of a hundred Turtles figures, and she was the only April there. And I had to have it. The Ultimate's April comes with her camcorder with a secret pistol just as she did originally, except now her camcorder has a full tripod to sit on, and the equipment case holds a lot more than just her microphone this time. April also comes with her press pass, a flashlight, microphone, a whole sprue of redundant Playmate-style accessories, and her turtle communicator in both open and closed versions. April is also proof that Super 7 doesn't have the easiest time with human characters. They've provided her with three heads, but the earliest promotional images of the figure look nothing like the resulting faces. From what I've seen, it's a roll of the dice whether you get heads with eyes in the right places, as her left eye is often too far away from her right one. And none of them look like the original renders from Super 7, which shouldn't be surprising given the stuff we've seen recently with their Silverhawks promotional images versus their actual figures. That being said, the faces aren't disasters, but they certainly don't live up to the potential of the sculpt. Not when you see what figure customizers have achieved with the same heads. Super 7 needs to step up its game in a lot of areas, and Human Faces is certainly one of them. I dare say the vintage April's face is far more detailed than the Super 7 Ultimates version. But even when, like myself, you are without detailed painting skills, if you are fortunate enough to get heads with properly placed eyes, April's noggins are all fine. I chose the one that looks closest to the vintage action figure, but that's not an indictment on the other two at all. Admittedly, it was a tough call between the more cartoon-style hair and the vintage action figure hair. In terms of posing, she can't do much because her single-jointed limbs don't allow for even full 90-degree bends. She's another stand-around figure like Splinter, but at least she stands really well, despite unsightly gaps between her waist and thighs. Last up for the heroes, we have Casey Jones. Yes, like the other figures, he is packed with a pile of redundant accessories on the Playmates weapons sprue, in addition to his more detailed sports equipment, including three hockey pucks. Casey doesn't come with alternate heads, and his torso is oddly placed on his waist piece, making his whole body look a bit off-center relative to his legs. Casey's waist joint alone should have sent this figure back to the drawing board, but Super 7 isn't known for striving for perfection. If Super 7 had a motto, it would be, it's close enough for government work. Tell me! You didn't pay money for this. Ooh. Casey Jones is probably one of the more disappointing entries in terms of the poses you can achieve here. This is another example of Super 7 not going far enough to deliver something that maximizes the opportunity to improve on the Playmates original. The result is much like Splinter and April, when it should be more like the Turtles. Now we come to the villains, and this is where I found the curb appeal of the TMNT Ultimates to pick up sharply. Normally, I love the heroes the most, and with the Ninja Turtles, that's no exception. But in terms of the visual impact of these Super 7 action figures, the villains run away with the show. We'll start with the boss man himself, Shredder. This figure is a massive improvement on the original Playmates version, but given virtually anything you did would improve that toy's position, literally and metaphorically, you could argue that's faint praise. All that aside, while Shredder also suffers the limited articulation Super 7 enthusiastically overcharges for, he's a grand step up from Shredder in his infamous pooping in place while at the mall stance. Super 7 decided, quite pointlessly, to give us an alternate head with the equally infamous paint error from the Playmates line where his eyebrows were added to the rim of his helmet. All of his weapons are duplicated onto the Playmates-style weapons rack, and like Splinter, he comes with a few extra sets of hands, as well as your choice of cloth cloak or a flexible PVC cape. Unlike Splinter, Super 7 did not put his vintage belt on the cape, but instead permanently sculpted it around his waist, meaning it will be under either cape. So even though the original Shredder figure wore the cape like a bathrobe belted at the waist, the plastic version cannot be cinched this way, while the cloth version has to be closed with a provided elastic belt with Velcro at the ends, encircled over the belt the figure is already wearing. However, the cloth cape has the advantage of being poseable thanks to flexible wire in the hem. Plus, the original figure's cloth cape worn like a bathrobe helped minimize the inexplicable design choice of making him shirtless otherwise. For all of these reasons, I chose the cloth version. Shredder's Foot Soldier is another nice upgrade from the robotic ape he used to be. Why Playmates had the Foot Clan crawling around on their knuckles is a riddle that has no answer, but thankfully no more. 
despite having joints that feel looser than a $50 figure should have, the Ultimate's foot soldier is more dynamic and versatile while retaining all of the original design work we remember. In addition to his classic weapons, duplicated pointlessly of course to increase the price, he also now comes with a laser rifle and laser pistol, just in case you prefer their cartoon depictions. I also opted to pick up Baxter Stockman, and this is one imposing action figure. This time, unlike the original vintage figure, the wings and upper arms are not removable. He comes with the redundant Playmates weapons, an extremely nice Mouser robot, some alternate pairs of hands, a laser pistol, and that weird fly swatter thing. On the original accessory, he just held it with the arm piece rotated over his forearm. With the Ultimates version, some people have placed the swatter attachment over the muzzle of the pistol. I'm not sure if this is an intentional design revision, but if you're like me and think it looks weird, he can hold it the original way as well. Baxter is an unexpected centerpiece figure in this range, with movable wings and arms. Like Splinter to a degree, his feet are tough to get in a position where he stands convincingly, but he doesn't have an issue remaining upright, it's simply an aesthetic thing. Lastly, but certainly not least, I've got to mention Bebop and Rocksteady as a pair. As much as I take issue with a lot of the choices Super 7 makes with their figure lines, their Ultimates Bebop and Rocksteady are a display shelf tour de force. First, I must make note of Super 7 taking no opportunity here to provide alternate parts to make these two more cartoon accurate. With Bebop, you get a brown head that swaps for the vintage-style pink head, but that's as close as Super 7 gets. Bebop comes with his drill blaster and trash can lid shield, now scaled down to reflect his massive size, an extra set of hands, his knife, and that extra set of Playmates weapons. Rocksteady is loaded for battle with his rifle, his sewer lid shield, his knife, and three grenades, along with some extra hands and his Playmates weapon set. But what makes this duo the standout pairing in the entire lineup are their sheer size. They tower over the other figures in a way the vintage originals could only hint at. For the first time, Bebop and Rocksteady look as dangerous and powerful as the story always led us to believe. And this is not achieved by changing their sculpts from the original style. It's accomplished by simply making them the size that was always intended. You might be wondering why Krang isn't here, as Super 7 has offered him up in the Ultimates range. The fact is simply that I cannot justify the $55 price tag for a character that is a brain in a bubble. I'd like to have him to complete the essential lineup of characters, but I'll wait for a sale or a clearance price from online retailers. Krang isn't worth that amount of money for what you get, despite Super 7 packing in two slightly different versions of Krang to sweeten the deal. Pass. The Super 7 Ultimate's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles line is a strange fog of a merchandising flex. It seeks to recapture the nostalgia of the vintage Playmates range, despite Playmates routinely reissuing various figures from that line every few years. At the same time, the Ultimates seem to aspire to take the Playmates figure designs to their fullest potential, with more detail and alternate heads for many of the figures, especially the Turtles. Yet at the same time, they won't build in the modern articulation that would truly maximize each figure's potential appeal, and they walk back in aesthetic areas where figures really need help such as their human face sculpts and paint applications. I almost wish this line had centered on the Mirage comics, but I suspect NECA has the lock on that side of the franchise. I'm very glad to have the figures I've acquired, as they represent what I consider the core of the Turtles mythology very well, and they have just enough added detail and posing potential that I'll happily display them but I probably won't buy more. For one, they don't need the duplicated accessories, nor do they need this much packaging. That just pads the price when people's wallets are already hurting. What they truly need are stronger joints, more articulation, better face sculpting, and superior paintwork. Until Super 7 makes those changes, the now raised price of $55 per figure is just too much to shell out. Either of you guys starting to feel like this year has just been revisiting Retro Blasting's greatest hits? Totally! Like, I know it's the 10th anniversary and all, but dude! Exactly! A big Star Wars Follies with flashbacks? A Voltron video with flashbacks? He did the video introducing the original Joes over again. I should know, I was pressed back into service to do it. He even finally did another restoration this year, another Star Trek video, a Transformers video, and he never does those. And don't forget, he did a 90 minute video on Indiana Jones toys as well. Insane. There was also that weird Spice Girls thing. Probably best to ride right past that.
and never mention it again. The only thing he hasn't done this year is Masters of the Universe. Oh no, he did. On Patreon. He had me do another Castle Grayskull tour for top tier patrons. Oh my god, see? And now he's doing Ninja Turtles again. Throw Broken Vader in this video and it would be pandemonium. I could have sworn I saw those toys move.